sure that you register at the front. Um, and if you haven't, you can do so before you leave. And we will email you the certificate um, for your CEs within the next two weeks or so. My assistant's going to have to issue them, and then we'll send them to you via email. If you have any questions, you can contact me. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Margo Kern and Onaje Marie. in the work that you do. 
We know that people who need human services the most are the same people whose human rights have been violated the most. But unfortunately, in our fields, they don't make that connection. So we, in the field of human services, wind up blaming the victim, uh, not realizing there was an anti-social contract against African people and against indigenous people from the very beginning of this, of this country. And this is not, we have uh, a misnomer that this is a nation state. This is not a nation state. It's a multi-nation state. And when you quiet and you silence those nations, you can just treat them as individuals. It's the same thing if we were to gather in your home with your family. And I say, these are just people who are just assembling here. That's not so. That is your family. That is a social unit. And this social unit of the nation of African people have been denied our recognition as a people and as a nation. So we have with us tonight uh, some of the most esteemed and learned, as well as activist human rights scholars uh, in the audience. And I'd like them to come up and join uh, the panel. Uh, first, we have uh, Dawuti Dasea, uh, and she is the founder, uh, chair of the NGO committee to eliminate racism, Afrophobia, as well as colorism. And joining her is the Dubies, uh, Roger Warren, who has gone back and forth to Geneva, Switzerland, four times and I've gone across the George Washington Bridge. And let me tell you, that's many times. Uh, he is the general secretary of an international NGO, and to his death is Esperanza Mattel, who has so many organizational affiliations that we will be here to next year. Uh, so the decade is from 2015 to 2024, so we are already behind. So, in, and since we started a little later uh, than expected, I'm not going to go into long bios, but I would ask uh, the panelists to um, give us their point. Different ways involved in shaping these documents um, and trying to actually implement them. Uh, the NGO Committee for the Elimination of Racism, Afrophobia, and Colorism that I chair has been at the UN for over uh, 15 years. Um, it's known as the Subcommittee for Elimination of, of Racism. But we've been in the UN as a coalition of, of uh, non-government uh, organizations, is what NGO stands for, um, uh, who have been calling attention to member states every single state that they've got to realize these, uh, uh, this moral and international mandate. Is this, because without full ratification of, um, of the German Declaration, there can't really be a decade. It's sort of like putting someone at a buffet table and you're taking their teeth out. It's a little hard to, to munch on stuff, to eat it, to enjoy it. Um, and so the work that we do at the UN, um, but the work that you do um, and, and working with us is about at least creating a pair of dentures, right? Um, giving substance and teeth and energy behind the work that is done. Um, one of the biggest shortcomings of the decade is not, is that not just the decade, but even the DDPA is that people either don't remember it or they don't know that it exists and they don't know what to do about it. So this convention, is, uh, this meeting that we're having tonight is, is really important in terms of bringing professionals, grassroots organizations, and NGO uh, uh, organizations together so that we can move forward and do something about realizing these goals, recognition, justice, and development. Thank you. Thank you. This is an organizing conference. And uh, the next speaker uh, was one of the chief organizers for the Durban 400 uh, that went to South Africa, and I was one of the delegates in that uh, congregation, uh, Roger Waram. Good evening. I mean, I know you're all professionals, but good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Just make sure there's a pulse. Um, I want to thank the task force for inviting me to participate. If I said that Malcolm X is responsible for you being here tonight, how many of you would agree? 
Okay. And I say that because one of the many lessons that Malcolm has taught us, and it's appropriate now, it's Black History Month, this is two days after the 52nd year of his assassination, was that the struggle, in particular, of black people needed to move beyond the constrictions of civil rights and take on the mantle of human rights. And in taking on the mantle of human rights, taking it outside the parameters of the, of the United States and United States laws and the restrictions to the laws that always pop up when we get close to achieving, supposedly get close to achieving equality, was to take it to the United Nations. And I belong to an organization called the December 12th Movement, and we took up very seriously that legacy and that demand that Malcolm put on us to not only struggle domestically, nationally, in the streets and all the different arenas, but also to take the question of the, our situation, human rights situation of African people in the United States, but throughout the diaspora, to the United Nations. And so beginning in 1989, we, you know, as Najee said, made yearly pilgrimages, and sometimes three or four times a year, to Geneva, Switzerland, which is not the most hospitable place in the world, to uh, make presentations to the United Nations around a situation that existed in the United States. And if you, for some of you, can remember back to 1989, this was a pre-internet, pre-Google day, and <laughs> in the international arena, the United States held sway as the foremost practitioner of human rights. And we were there, this small group of black folks, saying the emperor had no clothes on, that were, those were lies, and people did not have the information because they, where they got their information from. People were, in the international community, were under the impression that black folks were all right. They could see Michael Jordan, they could see Oprah Winfrey, they could see Bill Cosby before his fall, and say, well, they're doing fine. And we would always bring up the point that um, Langston Hughes supposedly made at one point back when the United Nations was first formed, and uh, Ralph Bunch was appointed the United States representative to the United Nations, and people were saying, this, that's a wonderful achievement for black people, that things are great, and Langston Hughes supposedly said, I can't eat Ralph Bunch for lunch. And the point he was making is that the achievements of a few people uh, do not reflect the conditions of the mass of people. So that when we went to the UN, we were raising up that question, in, in around mid-1990s, after Nelson Mandela had been freed in 1990, the uh, United States and the Western European countries, because those were the ones, the, the real uh, colonialists and settler colonies, were the ones who were always opposed to dealing with the issue of racism. When, when Mandela was freed, the Western countries wanted to remove the issue of racism from the human rights agenda of the Commission on Human Rights. And we were there fighting against that and fought for there to be a world conference against racism. And so when that finally happened, our demand and what we pushed with the many, many different organizations came together from you know, black folks from around the world, through the, throughout the Americas, throughout Europe, throughout Asia, came together. And we all had our specific grievances in terms of how white supremacy affected us. And what we struggled with people around and were successful in doing was getting us all to agree on that whatever our particular agenda was, at the top of that agenda would be three issues. One was the Declaration of the Transatlantic Slave Trade and Slavery as a crime against humanity. The second was for reparations. And the third, for, third was the recognition of the economic basis of racism. Because if we don't understand the economics underlying racism, we'll never be able to resolve it or deal with the, repairing the damage that it has done to people. So that's why I said Malcolm X is uh, responsible, or partially responsible, for this gathering because it was the legacy that he left and the implementation and struggle for that. Because none of this happened, you would go and get a few votes. This was, a, this was like a real struggle, as struggle occurs within the United Nations for that to occur. The United States, let me just ask you, and I think you know, Dewadi already spoke to it, but when you hear the word reparations, what do you think of? Money. Yeah. But I think the, the I think the general response people think of is money, because that's how it's always been equated. 
And I was um, one of the lawyers on a lawsuit that was filed back in 2002, challenging 18 major U.S. corporations, a demand for reparations based upon the fact that they wouldn't exist today had they not made their money off of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. But, the re but money is only an aspect of it. The reparations comes from the word repair. And so that's, that's, the, that's the, the issue, and I think that's why Onaji and Marva put this in the context of the World Conference because the work that you do as professionals is to repair. It's to repair damage. It's to repair what society, different conditions have done to people. And so that we wanted to have that judgment informed by that it's really um, the, the, the long-term, long-range answer to that is the demand for reparations. And, the, and that, that can take many different forms. It's not simply money. It can be hospitals. It can be um, media. I mean, there's different. It can be free education all the way through. Free quality education, not just warehousing people in schools. So the international decade was, again, a result of a, of a struggle. Because what happened back in Durban in 2001 was we were able and Anadi said that we took 400 people to Durban to, to lobby the countries to get this declaration passed in alliance with the African countries and the Caribbean countries. That was a fight. The United States walked out of the, walked out of the conference. The United States has stated even before the conference began that if reparations or compensation, however you wanted to call it, was on the agenda, that they were not going to participate. And of course, they had the nerve to have a black woman chairing the delegation when they made that when they made that declaration. And so, at the point when it became clear in the conference that this was still alive and kicking the, the issue of reparations, the United States walked out. They just walked out, and they, they claimed they walked out because it was they were supporting Israel, but the, Israel was not even an issue at the World Conference in terms of the official conference. That was just a cover of fig leaf. And since that time, the United Nations and the Western countries have been struggling to just make, as she said, make this Durban Declaration disappear like it never happened. They started the day after the conference ended. And then they got an unintended boost when two days after we got back from the conference, there were the attacks at the World Trade Center on 9-11. And so everything that had happened at that point in time around the World Conference got lost behind in, in the wake of that tragedy. So over these past few years of Duwadi laid out, there have been some different things that occurred around an international decade, an international year for people who have in this set, an international decade. These were all struggles. But what you will notice in the international year or the international decade, there is no mention of the word reparations. The theme of the international decade, recognition, justice, and development, that was a struggle and a compromise. Because once again, the Western countries said, if you put the word reparations in there, we are not going to support it. Not that they supported it anyway, but we are not going to support it. So recognition, justice, and development was a compromise. As professionals, when, you, when you're treating people, when you're repairing people, you have to identify the, the roots of, their, of, of what's causing the issues that they're dealing with and, and clarify the development and, and how they challenge it. I would just end by saying that your the, the that the decade the decade is not going to be carried out by the member states. They haven't put any money into it. The fact that you haven't heard about it is a reflection of that. And certainly the United States didn't do it under Obama and you can be sure as hell it's not going to do it under Trump. <laughs> you know? So for the decade to be alive, for the decade to serve its purpose, which is to help repair the damage done to Africans in throughout the diaspora, because no matter where they dropped us and what language we speak today or what, or what accent we speak with, it's, it's a reflection of the, of the colonial experience of the fact that their wealth is tied to our exploitation and our unpaid labor. Uh, as, as professionals, I would hope that your treatment would also be informed by people like Frantz Fanon or people like Paolo, Paolo Freire who, took the, who looked at the issue of supposed victims, identified the source and how to get them past their victimhood to be able to develop as fully developed human beings. 
And I would end it with um, the theme that we had at the World Conference and to this day is, they stole us, they sold us, they owe us reparations now. Thank you. We have uh, now our uh, distinguished uh, Afro-Latina, Puerto Rican sister who, um, she could have been on both panels, really, because she has that level of experience, and she's been doing so much healing in the New York City area, and we're honored to have Esperanza Mattel with us. Welcome. Just to start with what Roger and the reparations now, we are all big time, big time. I'd like everybody to stand up.
and we maximize the opportunity because the door is open. And now we need to step through. So, you know, let's, let's remember that it's collectivism that has brought us as a people from day one through everything to where we are right now. But collectivism is in danger because we are living under a society, within a society, that is not about collectivism. It is about capitalism. It is about, and it has shifted the mindset, the spirit set from we to me and I. Everybody's so busy chasing their cheese that they forget about they're part of a greater whole. And it's so much more effective and f efficient to achieve goals when we're working together versus just trying to get mine. Could you just go to the mic? Um, I'm supposed to speak to me now. You better stop listening to, to um, the exact, you know, it's like, it's like a type. <laughs> um, I am a New York City social worker. I recently quit my day job because I wanted to serve my community of brown black people who look like me in my hometown of West Africa. Um And growing up in Brooklyn in the 80s and 90s, it was a community that looked more like me. Um, my principals, my teachers, uh, my my minister. We are live streaming. Oh, I'm sorry. And they really can't hear you. Yeah, that's why the mic is might be being asked. Oh, Ben? Yes. Okay. Um, my question, what you know, I, what I took away from Mr. Curse, that's um, fine. what you said was I had a Black History teacher who I just thought it was normal that we had black history, who used to say when we would misbehave, you're nothing and you're never gonna be nothing. And out of all of the things that my teachers have ever said to me, that's one of the things that stick with me because I know that there are some people that I went to school with who actually believed her. Um, where do you, you guys feel, and I feel like um, Dr. T kind of touched on it, where do you feel I don't, I don't know what the term is. Would it be exclusion? Would it be separatism? Um, for black people to come together and pool our resources by ourselves to collectively invest in our communities to make these changes that we need. Because it's not gonna happen under the federal government. If white Jesus ain't coming to save us. So there's, there's a point in time where we have to come together as a community, which I, I felt like I had growing up in bed -Stuy. It gave me the self-esteem to know that even though she was teaching me, she was teaching me one thing that made me feel empowered, she was also saying something else. And I know that, you know, we as black people, we, we internalize our bias. Where do you think the role is of us doing it for us and by us going to um, take us in these next 10 years? Well, I'm, I'm going to put this under the umbrella of mental uh, dis-ease, which, which causes behavior, uh, behaviors. Let's like say inappropriate, I'm just going to say certain behaviors. Right now what I see is a community that allows self-degrading behaviors to occur within the communities. And for example, how many of us have been on a bus or a train that is predominantly adults of color? And you have one or two other individuals get on that train or that bus and their behavior the words that come out of their mouth, the 
the things they say and the things that they do. And I'm not just saying young people, I'm saying other people. But nobody says anything. And we sit there in our chairs and we are so uncomfortable. We are just seething internally. And we look at each other, we close our eyes, we, we squirm in our chairs, we put our earphones on, we do anything that we have to do other than say, hey, that behavior is unacceptable. That language is unacceptable. This is my grandmother sitting next to me. This is my mother sitting next to me. This is my daughter sitting next to me. That's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's mother. And y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know exactly the words I'm talking about that have become the norm. Yet, we don't say anything. We just allow it and then we go, we get angry. And then that anger, that anger, anger that we carry from that situation and situations upon situations upon situations just like that, we take that and we unleash that in other arenas of our lives, on ourselves, on people that it wasn't even for. But we really wanted to say something, but we didn't. And we have to ask ourselves why. Was I afraid to get shot? Yep. Was I afraid to get stabbed? Of course. You know, was I, was I afraid of what would be the consequences if I stood up for what was right? And that in itself is a mental, spiritual, and social dis-ease. And that's not something that the man, the system is doing, because that's our community. So until we take responsibility and accountability for getting our own homes in order, that's where it begins and ends. We can talk about what has happened to us for 500 years, but the bottom line is until we get our own homes in order, things are not going to change for much. I don't believe. And I could be wrong because I started this evening saying, I don't know anything. And I still don't. But I do know if we don't speak up for ourselves, and it begins and ends in our homes, on the block, in our own communities. Yeah, I just wanted to respond in terms of the question you asked about economics. And I, I, I think that we could start, and this is my suggestion, by supporting black institutions, black businesses, Watch where, where you're spending your money, who you're spending your money with. I think that's really important. So that would be my suggestion. I mean, you know, you really, you have to look hard now to find out what, what shops, what businesses are owned by people of African descent, but you can find them. And so everything, from where you get your nails done, to where you get your hair done, to the clothes you wear, to the jewelry you wear, um, to where you, where you do your shopping for other goods, I think it's important. And to uh, support institutions, uh, black schools, black universities, um, black, put your money in black banks. There are a lot of things we can do to start that process. What's your name, sister? Nikita. Nikita. Um, I think you did already. You know, you said uh, you had experiences growing up in Bethel Stuyvesant with teachers or others um, told you about you were worthless, never amount to anything. 
because yet you did amount to something. Uh, you had a job where you could have took care of yourself personally, but you decided to leave that job to go back to your community to help out. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those things are representative of doing something and using the knowledge that you've gained to help, you know. Because a lot of times we think that it takes a million people to turn this thing around. All it takes is a motivated few to keep spreading the message. And that's why I keep saying this whole thing about the United Nations message is very important because it's the messaging that is important. I was told the same thing, you know, that I would never amount to anything. But yet I went back to school and got me an associate degree, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree, you know. Um, I was told that I would never be successful, but I see my life is going from Park Vince to Park Avenue, you know. And so in many ways, you know, what people say and what people think doesn't really matter. As long as you're determined to help your people and to do the things that are necessary to help pull them up out of the situations that they're in. So I applaud what you're doing. There is um, someone at the mic who I must mention to you is part of a collective. Uh, all the brothers from Staten Island who are part of True to Life, please stand up. These men that you're seeing before you are in the streets every day to prevent gun violence. They are part of New York City's Cure Violence Program. Please give them a hand. On behalf of True Violence, I'd like to thank all y'all for giving us a call. Uh, my name is Malik, and uh, I want to address this very important issue. The brother just showed y'all way out in the streets, in our community, talking to our young brothers, our young warriors, about putting the guns down. We not mandated reporters. We don't work with the police department. We sort of like, to me, the Junior Black Panther movement or BLA movement, not the distorted part that so-called history betrayed about our brothers and sisters. I was incarcerated in federal prison for 20 years, and I was around a bunch of brothers that got locked up at early ages when Trump was charged by our government. Uh, Sunni Ali Akola, uh, Fela Haru, Countless, John Old Pratt. I've been with a bunch of brothers. And what we did, we, we, had, a, we had a think tank inside of federal prisons, penitentiaries. We got together Saturdays, and we talked about issues in our community. I was a drug dealer. So I wasn't a political prisoner. And I looked at these brothers like they had life sentences for setting up programs to feed our kids, for educating our kids. And I was a baby at the time. I'm 53 years old and I spent 24 years of my life in jail. My success story, my testimony, my transformation is that I'm not out in the streets no more. But the city is paying us to go out on the streets to clean up the community, to stop the killing in our community, for who? For who? It's a blessing that we not turn the guns on each other, but let's look at the real picture, because we're talking about mental health issues, we're talking about financial issues, who's controlling the money, Who's controlling the neighborhoods where we clean up the gun violence? Who's going to move in? Are they really using us for the purpose of saving each other, or is it economics? Whole bunch of brothers from all over the city. We all over. Cure violence is all over. It started out in Chicago as a grassroots. I was locked up with vice lords, gangster cycles. All these brothers from out of Chicago, and they changed their philosophies while they was in jail. The leaders. The gangs of disciples try to call themselves God disciples. You know what a vice lord is? 
And we, we worship the Lord of the fights. Now they took the funding from these brothers out there in Chicago for the same organization that we're working with now, Cure Violence, how New York City adopted that. But they left them brothers out in the cold in Chicago right now. They took their funding from them. And Cure Violence is all over the world. I want y'all to Google it. It's in Africa, it's all over the world. But we gotta be ever mindful. Like the brother said, we don't control nothing. So the education that we have to give from our brother right here, we had a crisis in Staten Island, he came out there, we didn't embrace him right away. We felt that energy, we felt that spirit. We knew he wasn't an agent. Because we change the social norms in the community, it's not right to, to do certain things. But we have let Donald Trump, and he's doing things. But we have representatives that's in these office. We gotta get them out of it. If they're not looking out for the best interests, we gotta start using our political power. <coughs> Trump can stay where he want. He can do the four years. But every two years, you gotta elect your representative. And I don't care if it's Republican or Democrat, they're all the same. So my spill to you, brothers and sisters, I'm glad I came. I serve my community to the best of my ability. And I ain't gonna never stop. I don't care if the funding run out. We can get together. Because we doing it anyway, we doing the work anyway. But like the brother said, we gotta mobilize and come together for a common cause and stop looking at the leaders of certain organizations and being judged by them organization leaders. I've been a part of the Universal School Nation for years. Our leader was a brother by the name of the founder. I'm not gonna call him a leader. The founder was a brother by the name of Africa Bambada. And he got accused of certain things. You no know, social things. But this is a worldwide movement. It was a worldwide movement building truth, love, peace, and having fun. But it was also an educational program. Self-help program. You can't let one leader taint nothing. You can't let one president taint nothing. We can't let one teacher tell you you ain't gonna be nothing. Because I asked a question when I was in high school. Excuse me. Well, this is George Washington. History don't have anything to do with me getting a job. My history teacher told me I was gonna wind up in jail for a long time. And I did, a long time in jail. You know why? Because it was pre-written. It was a script for me. And I followed that script. Now mental health, these brothers right here, social workers of African descent, I'm a social worker. I ain't got no degree. But I can talk to the brothers and sisters in the street and I'll do the right thing. Thank you for your time. Don't tell my brothers. I may be long winded. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. <laughs> My name, well, they call me Frank Weston in the Western world here. But I'm not here anymore. I went home to work. What you're seeing is a spirit. And I'm here to share that spirit with you just for a few minutes. Bear with me. When the brother said that uh, this was an organizing conference, that's right. Then let's do that. Let's organize. Don't sit there on the panel and tell me that you don't know what you're talking about, and you shouldn't be up there. Don't show me your cowardness. That's not that it's here in the room tonight. I'm not suggesting that, but don't show us that. Young men, where else? Look around the room. Save for huh, there is a way. And why? Because we're imprisoning ourselves 
in a prison that we've already escaped from. I went home to Africa. I just gave a moderator there a book. You haven't mentioned it. You should look at the cover and you should mention it. I'm not here to preach to you or anyone or to myself. But I'm saying, let's not, let's stop hiding. We won. We own a continent. And everything in that continent is feeding this world. China could not put two toothpicks together, as America has not been able to do. It has failed. It has failed because it screwed itself, pardon the expression. Who are these white Americans who are coming here and are supporting other whites? What is this white thing? What is this black thing? We have cultures, all of us. Europeans came out of Europe because many of them was forced out of Europe, thrown out of Europe. Well, now they're here making the same mistake that they made in Europe. And damn it, we're not going to let you do it, whoever they are. I've gone into Africa the way I came into New York City with less than two buck fifty in my pocket. And it was people like you on the streets of New York that supported me. I had nothing. But with the grace of my ancestors and you, I was able to build into manhood. When I went back to Africa, and since 1978, we've been taking real estate, taking it by force. It's all documented. It's all been supplied and given to the United Nations. We have taken enough land in Africa already, from Congo to Zimbabwe, to move 3.5 million Africans from Brazil to here back to Africa. And the panel don't know about this? <coughs> Social workers don't know about this. They're not talking about this. I've written a book called Do You Have a Return Ticket? Universities, some of the some of the representatives here in this students are here in this in this hall tonight. Universities are calling on me and the book to do what? To teach what's in that book or to lecture to what's in that book to PhD students, to students. Universities. I came out of Alabama with less than my high school education. I had more D's on my report card, I'm going to be long. I had more D's on my report card than you can count in the dictionary. But I got into NYU, and I came out of there a 4.0 Dean's List honor student. There's nothing wrong with my brain, nothing wrong with any African person's brain. The oppression, I wonder who is the oppressed. Because what I'm about to say in the last couple of minutes is this, is that you should be telling people, our people, our young people, and our old people, that they do have a land and that they never lost that land. We came here, we gave up nothing. Our ancestors gave up nothing, and we've signed nothing. And I've said this to the world at the United Nations. It's all there, it's all in the records. So I want to see some spirit take place here, because I'm insulted, I'm embarrassed. Begging for what? There's nothing in America that I need to beg for. We're paying them to stay alive. My brothers and sisters, and allies, if you're in this room, I see you as an ally. Let's stop being cowardly with our approach. A brother told me in Zimbabwe, 1989, they invited me there to go on television to help throw the whites off the land. Whites, in this case, they started, I didn't, so I don't mean to, to, to insult anyone by these words, Europeans. Nine years after independence, they were refusing to leave the land. They did not want to leave the land. They refused. And they were putting sanctions on Zimbabwe for even trying to force them to get off the land that the blacks had taken back. We, you, all of us, whites, blacks, everybody, we worked to help free Zimbabwe. But now the American government has sanctions on Zimbabwe so much that you, you can take all the collective chains around people's necks throughout slavery. It wouldn't amount up to the amount of chains that's still around Zimbabwe's neck in Zimbabwe. So when you want to talk about saving the students and helping our young people and helping our communities, then let's go and do that. But you can't do it here. Let's reach across the pond to Africa and tell those African heads of states out there that Africa is not there. It belongs to the people. And I don't see social workers dealing with that. I don't see you at the United Nations picketing these, these African heads of states who come in here, selling our land and our property when it's not theirs to sell. I've sent the letter to the Security Council. Many of you know what that is. It's, a, it's an organization at the United Nations. And we have pressed charges against every nation on this planet 
through the petition that we've given to the Security Council. And you know what the Security Council has done? They've come back and said, we have taken your charges, Mr. Weston, and we're putting it into action. All I ask as I leave the mic is that let's do some research and stop looking at what is local here. This place is toast. Donald Trump tells you that. Unless African Americans wealth come into this country to keep the lights on. Next week this time, these lights won't be on because that's where the energy is coming from. Bill Gates, everything he owns, he owes it to Africa. And that is a word called Colton, C-O-L-T-A-N, Google it. Thank you so much, Frank. Thank you. So um, we want to just thank the panel. If they can stay, uh, we certainly invite you to do that. This is the organizing conference. The third piece of the conference is, to, oh, I'm sorry, is one other person that tonight. I know. <laughs> I was just kind of so fast. Um, I just had to come up because I've been in civil rights since 1966. I started out in Columbus, Ohio as part of the Columbus Area Civil Rights Council. And they put me in charge of organizing and checking for housing so that people could move into neighborhoods that were never integrated. Um, and we started moving and we did good. And the neighborhoods, the walls broke down. And I, it was so exciting to watch when we found federal class action and uh, and OACP Legal Action Center came and, you know, heard the cases and we won the cases, but the best case of all, we won the case, but they gave the family $200, which was not right. But we won, and then we did busing from inner city neighborhoods to non-inner city neighborhoods and vice versa. And that really made a big difference because people learned a lot about the difference in cultures and were able to get along with each other. And that was really good. About the last two years, I've been looking at what's going on, maybe more than that. And it's so depressing because we've gone back to 1966. And now they have prisons where 79% of the people in prison are black men. And those black men are being enslaved. And it's legal because uh, um, the, the, the Constitution says in Article 13 that if they commit a crime, then they can be in, in, enslaved. I do not understand that. But here I am. If I can be of any help, I will be. And Is there a question for the family, or just a statement? It's just really a statement. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just. I thought I had to say it. It is, yeah, still in a statement, that's for sure. So, a handout has been given to you. Uh, you will notice that it has the three themes of the decade. Recognition, justice, and development. You will also notice there is something additional that we haven't spoken about to this point. And that is the Center for Health Equity that was founded by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene has created this center for four purposes. One is to support internal reform within itself, within the Department of Health. They are looking at how structural racism is occurring inside the Department of Health. This is what our health commission is doing. She has gone on to say that it's there to build partnerships to advance social justice in addition to make injustice visible via data collection. And the fourth is to invest in neighborhoods who have traditionally been deprived of resources. So we have a blueprint. We have a blueprint in terms of the principles of the decade. We also have a blueprint in terms of using these four objectives that the center has created to take back to our respective agencies and see how we can implement them in our agencies. So it's not that racism just occurs inside of the Department of Health. It's all over, ubiquitous, as they say. So now I'd like you to do is partner up in small groups of four or three and discuss with each other how are you going to bring 
this work back to your workplace, to your agency? How would you bring this back to your trading agencies so that we can continue so you become the catalyst for this to go out to all the people who did not know about this event and or did know and couldn't make it. You become that person and persons to in fact keep this moving. So this is an organizing conference. And then after you have that discussion, we're going to collect your um, the notes that you're, you're making and then we're going to compile a master sheet uh, a report and make that accessible to you. So not only do you benefit from the implementations that you have thought about yourself, but you also benefit from the collective intelligence in the room. So um, I made extra copies so that you will be able to take a copy with you back to your respective agencies and you can then initiate that same process with them. So I'm going to, let's see, it's five minutes to nine. Uh, so I'm going to give you 15 minutes for your small group um, organizing. It's called the Decade Organizing Action Worksheet. It's the organizing conference. And then after we, after you have that discussion, uh, we're going to open the floor up for to share some of the things that you've discovered, and then we're going to have closing remarks. So we have 15 minutes. Let's give the panel another hand, please. to in both 
our clients, we are really, really uh, giving them the strength and education that they need to lift themselves out of the misery of capitalism. Look, I believe in creating the rules society. You don't know what the new societies. That's why all of us are here today. Because our people, in the midst of the violence of safety slavery, were able to see that there was something beyond that. And they took off to the mountains. Right? And they played. They played the house nigger. Yes, master. Right? Go so see a film called Sam Kofa talks about this. And in the evening, they were freedom fighters who liberated the world. So that's what my work is about. I do, I can see, I've been doing, I don't think I've spoken about this, I'm almost finished, for 30 years. I've been doing healing circles for people of color in New York City. I don't write about this. I don't talk about this. It's nobody's business. Most of the young people that come through these circles are organized, who are addicted to alcohol, who are addicted to drugs, you name it, and are organizing. And they find their center, they find their soul, they find their spirit, they find their power. Right? I say to people, I'm a way station, folks. They pass, they just pass. So that's the word. You want to do human rights work, you want to support the work at the United Nations at Geneva, right? You could be in a committee, very wonderful. Or you could take human rights to the streets and teach the Declaration of Human Rights. Teach it. That's all we have. Right now, all we have is the Constitution of this country. You should be walking with it in your back pocket. Because we are, I was going to say an epitome, but we're worse than an epitome. And we are all that we got. So we need to educate ourselves. Go to the website of the United Nations. Look at the company. Look at the work that they have been talking about. Take it to your clients. I've mostly worked in African communities 
people to African descent. I worked in West Africa, Central Africa, North Africa, with the African communities in the U.S. I got excited about the Black Lives Matter movement. And when I went to the website, I was really like just discouraged. So I'm just wondering if someone can enlighten me about the movement, maybe a little bit of history. Uh, the message that was clear was that uh, that people of African descent should be leaders, which I totally agree, right? They should lead the movement. But they say on their website that they have the discretion to tell people of not of African descent to go away, basically, that they can't participate. So do you have any perspective on Excuse me, I'm going to that. Uh, defer that question. Uh, these are human rights experts. They're not representatives of Black Lives Movement. Uh, okay. to keep to the agenda that which we were created. Thank you. Well, I just wanted their perspective on... If they I, stay, if they stay okay. later, they can answer that. They, they're, not, they're not speaking for Black Lives Matter. They can speak for their respective organizations, but not that matter. Thank you so much. Any other questions from the audience? This is a rare opportunity. Yes, sir. Use the mic. Can you use the mic? I don't know my mic. My voice carries. What exactly got you involved with human rights in the UN? I'll start. Um, no, I never thought of myself as a human rights activist. I just thought I was doing the right thing. And my work started out um, in the cultural arena. I'm a curator, I've been an arts administrator, um, I'm a photographer. Um, but racism, uh, exists everywhere, permeates every single aspect of our lives. And, um, and at the end of the day, culture is the most, uh, that's the most important thing that what defines us as human beings. And human beings, it's also where uh, power is taken away uh, and, and, um, and others are, some cultures are elevated and others are put down. So I, I started out um, fighting for our communities. Uh, black and brown communities and um, making sure that we got documented, make, making sure that our organizations got funded, that sort of thing. And then I was called on to be the executive director of the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial Center um, at the Audubon Ballroom where Brother Malcolm was uh, assassinated. And so my work took a shift from just, you know, the, the artsy part of culture into the, the political arena, but also using culture, films, um, uh, scholarship, uh, dance, anything that could give that message about power, about repair. I just want to say one thing about reparations. Reparations isn't just about the monetary aspect of things or policy changes. There is, um, there is an implicit guarantee of non-repetitiveness. That is, the act is not to occur again. And the fact that this country and other countries are following suit refuse to um, provide reparations isn't simply because it's going to change the, the world's order economically, but because we live in a prison industrial complex that thrives on sickness and incarcerating people, especially through the use of drugs, that keeps you enslaved and effectively um, repeats the crime against humanity. And so the realization of these things, um, working at the Shabazz Center, um, but I was also at uh, the World Summit for Sustainable Development, I don't know if I remember meeting me, at the pre-con meetings that took place in, in Durban before everyone, uh, and uh, we were in Johannesburg before everyone went to, to Durban itself, but that started taking me down the path of actually working uh, at, at the UN. Um, because you, you, you can't always fight outside of the palace walls. Sometimes you've got to fight from within. Yes, one more question. Good afternoon. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, Malcolm X's autobiography, which I read a couple of years after he was assassinated, and I, from the time I was about 17 or 18, I've been involved in organizing in the streets of our people, and that that was another aspect of what he talked about, and I belong to an organization that, at the point in time when we said we've got to, we've got to do this. Um, part I have a legal background, so they said that's you know that was helpful in terms of doing it. So I became sort of the the, the Geneva designate. 
<laughs> which, which is, is, is not romantic at all. Geneva was like a very expensive place and a very cold place. Um, but that was a necessary arena. And I, I would just say, it's very, when we went there, it was the Cuban representatives who told us that, you know, over the years, different black folks have come, and they come once, and then they don't come back. They said, if you want to make an impression, if you want to get something done here, you've got to come every year. You've got to come to the point when you walk in that room, they know what you're there about. So that meant that we were there. And in understanding that this is no substitute for what we have to do in the streets. This is just another, it's a propaganda vehicle. The UN isn't going to resolve squat. They, you know, it really isn't. But it's a propaganda vehicle to raise your issue that you're, that you're fighting for. And that's, as long as you understand that, and don't, you know, there's people, the UN looks out at Lake Geneva, it's beautiful. You, there's some delegates from different countries, they get addicted to that. So whatever was initially brought them there, they're into like, wow, Geneva's just beautiful. So that's not how we, you know, it was, we do our street work, we do this, and they, they're all part of the same thing. In, I'm not, in, um, I started doing political prisoner work in the early 70s. I was 24 when I started doing political. And part of it was capturing, recapturing my history and really learning that we had five, at that time, five Puerto Rican political prisoners. Um, I've worked not only on Puerto Rican prisoner campaigns, but also the African American political prisoners, the new Africans, and the Native American and even Asian political prisoners. A, and that's what took me to the United Nations, that work. Because the only way, the only way freedom fighters get free is if the president, in a federal prison, if the president of the United States pardons them or gives them clemency or gives them amnesty. Or they die in jail, like most of our a new African and African American political prisoners are doing. And Leonard. And Leonard Pochet, who's very ill, and Mia is very ill. So that a, the UN gives you the ability to put the pressure on the United States government to free the prisoners. And one of the things that I learned very and early on is what Roger said. You have to be consistent and persistent. People will know you. Like, people, kids knew me in the 70s as the counter lady, right? You know, you remember that in the 70s it was illegal to give out condoms? I was giving out condoms, right? Before AIDS, before AIDS it was illegal, okay? So people got to know you, and that this is what you do. Right? And you got to rub shoulders with people that you think you never would. But that's part of the political work. That's part. Uh, that's because of time, and also because we will have more space in the program for questions and answers, I won't entertain any uh, questions now, but you will have a time to do that. Um, I can also inform that there are two mics. When we do open up again for question and answer, there are two mics on either side of the room, uh, so you'll know that. Um, I, I do apologize, but there will be more time that we'll have, have this um, open space. But I will like, I have to say, in fact, that my mother Sylvia Oliver has come to this event tonight. I will not be any place that to announce my mother. So we all was here. Also, we'll not be in place. We'll not be in place without announcing my wife, Dr. Fatima Hafiz, is in the room. And I will not be in the room without announcing my sister, Madame Jean Oliver Taylor, is also in the room.
So this, this is a, a night for us to give information. Uh, and now the next panel, I'll just uh, please, the panelists for this next panel, please come up while I'm talking. Um, reparations has three aspects. Compensation, restitution, and rehabilitation. And if you happen to be a human service worker, be a psychologist, be a uh, social worker, be a uh, social abuse uh, counselor, or uh, uh, any other human service worker, the greatest debt that you can actually go to in your profession is to understand your work as a healer in service to reparations, in service to rehabilitation. And if we don't have that understanding, the most we can become is gatekeepers. If you look at the professions, these health professions, they've been put in place as a buffer zone to make sure that those who are at the bottom of society will not explode. It's okay to implode. You can drink. You can you shoot, you shoot, shoot drugs. You can beat your wife. You can do all these things but don't explode on the system. And now our profession is being challenged to take on what it really is to be a helper and someone who was going to liberate not only the body, but the mind and the soul. It was talked about that um, this lack of history. When we don't, when, people, when you can make a people ahistorical, if you can make them apolitical, and if you can make them a futuristic, you have colonized that people. People don't know their history intentionally. People don't think they have the power to change their lives intentionally. And people don't have the idea of the futures for them intentionally. <clears throat> On reservations, people as young as eight years old are committing suicide in packs. Where does that come from? It comes from Pratt, General Pratt, who said, kill the Indian to save the man. And that's happened to all people of color when it comes to when Europeans have came into their countries to take their land and their resources and exploit them for their labor. And that's still happening today. So if we're going to live up to the ethical system of our professions, it's really going back and finding that history. <coughs> My dear sister Gloria, please join us. Audience, I must say, you are actually sitting before some of the hardest working people in this city. And both panels are working for the same thing. And that is the wellness and the healing of the people of the nation. So, Thaddeus, Dr. Thaddeus, Talon Brown is with us today. Uh, we also have Gloria Scott, who is the President of the Alliance of Black Social Workers here in New York City uh, that preceded, in fact, the founding of the National Association of Black Social Workers. She, in fact, is the president of the New York chapter. Before that, the, before the National was created, New York chapter was already in formation. And you must know the reason why the National Association of Black Social Workers, of which I'm a member as well, came into existence because they walked out of the National Conference of Social Workers in 1968 because of a lack of recognition, because of a lack of justice, and because of a lack of development. And to her left, uh, we have Brother Roy Kears, who not only is the Vice President of Samaritan Village, he's also the second Vice President of our chapter. So I'm gonna let them say any words that they would want you to know about themselves and, and talk about um, the work they've been doing, but also respond to the first panel. How now, hearing what you heard from the first panel, can you use that information to further do the work that you're doing and the healing modalities that you work in? Please give them a welcome and hand. Greetings, brothers and sisters. 
I come to you with a uh, firm understanding that I know nothing. So I'm not going to try to convince you of what I have to say is correct, the right way to go, that you should follow that way. I want you to use your own conscience and put this puzzle together for yourself. My slave name is Tyrone Brown. There are tens of thousands of Tyrone Browns right here in the United States. The name that I answer to is T. Thaddeus Amara. Because I am a man. And I don't need any institution, government, or any other human beings to define for me what I am. I understand that we as a people have been subject to colonial rules and regulations, oversight on this great plantation that we call the United States of America, but even more so the Western Hemisphere, for over 500 years, going on six. So when we talk about human rights, mental health, things of that nature, someone alluded to it earlier, how can you have wellness in a sick environment, under sick conditions that are prevalent, severe, and chronic? When you talk about social determinants of health, let's just focus on the mental health aspects. And let's look at mental health not just as diagnosed, mental distress, disease, disorder, illness, whatever you want to call it, according to the model that has been presented to us to diagnose in the field of mental and behavioral health. A model that was not and is not designed to address the longitudinal, historic trauma and oppression that has been placed upon the heads, the hearts, and the spirits of generation after generation of people who are not aligned spiritually, mentally, with the colonial doctrine. How can there be health when your whole experience has been one of oppression, pain and suffering, physical, psychological, social, how can there be health or mental health? They say, if you want the truth, if you want to know the truth, the first place you look is on the inside.
because that's a deep one. We're not going to blame the victims or the survivors. But let's not forget to ask ourselves what part we've played and continue to play. in our situation, past, present, and if we don't get it right real soon, there may not be much of a future. So let's go back to mental and behavioral health from a human services perspective. Well, before you can treat appropriately treat or work with someone who is in distress, duress, and we're just talking about people who are, have a clinical diagnosis. We're not even talking about all of the undiagnosed. And when I say all of the undiagnosed, I'm talking about if you've been in America, for any, any period of time, you've got some type of traumatic experience, some type of mental uncomfortability. I don't want to say disorder or illness, but let's say DIS hyphen ease, some type of internal uncomfortability with the climate for which you live in. So think about that. But we can't treat anybody. We can't put bandages on broken legs and expect people to give up. We even have to be real careful about the language we throw around. Mm. What is recovery? What is recovery? Are we recovering? from the acute disorder, or are we recovering something that we never had, which was to be treated justly and fairly, with equality as a fully participating partner in the human race? What are we recovering? There are things in my personal life I am not trying to recover. Habilitation, eh, that's another word we have to be careful with. You know, folks was doing pretty good until they got kidnapped, you know, abducted and forced to live under conditions that they did not initially intend to participate in. But let's think a little bit about my earlier question, the part we played in it. The rabbit hole goes pretty deep, people. The question is, how deep do we want to go? Because before we can dig ourselves out, we have got to know the truth about who we are and why we are here and what are some of the true catalysts that drove us being here. The truth goes really deep. But let's go back to mental and behavioral health in relationships to human rights. Before there can be human rights, first you have to be considered to be a human. And before there can be health, you have to be considered a human. And before there can be mental health, there has to be health because it's all interrelated as we know. So I'm going to stop there. There will be more time for discussion and questions and all of that. You know, do your own thinking, folks. Do your own research. But deep down inside of us, the answers that we seek are waiting to reveal themselves to us.
Sister Glory, yes. Uh, yes, good evening everyone, good evening. sisters and brothers. I'm honored to be here with this distinguished panel, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, Marva asked me to describe myself, and I consider myself an African woman born in the Americas, but the seed of Africa lives in me. And that's not original. Dr. Marimba Ani said the seed of Africa is born in all of us. And so I, I think this, when we talk about this decade, I think that we're doing what I've been doing all my life, advocating for the rights of people of African descent. And I do that through my organization, but I did that even before I was involved with the Association of Black Social Workers, which I've been in that organization over 30 years. But I came to know about that organization walking on a picket line. Um, it was advocating for daycare centers in the 70s not to close. And so that's how I found out about the organization. Someone asked me, did I know about the organization? I said, no. And they said, well, you should come and join us. And that's how I got involved. But we see uh, through this organization that we advocate for all people of African descent in our community. We provide services in the community. Um, and we help our community deal with the impact of racism. And that's really important because it affects all aspects of our life. We work on social justice issues. We try to impact social policy, look at health disparities, and make a mark wherever we can. As our motto for the Association of Black Social Work, our code of ethics tells us not to distinguish our destiny from the destiny of our brothers and sisters. So it's important that we remember that we're all affected by what's going on. And right now, we're in critical times. I don't know, we, we often don't think of how the immigration policy, the attack on religion, the Affordable Care Act revolution are going to impact on our community. We don't often think about how many immigrants of African descent that we have living here in the Americas. So we have to be aware of that. And I think um, what Dr. Kurt said just, I'm sorry, not Dr. but Dr. T just said about um, how we treat each other, I think we have to educate ourselves and stop pathologizing um, our community, but really helping them deal with what is going on with them how racism impacts their lives, how it impacts their inability to provide, it impacts their inability to get a job. Um, that's where we come into some of the social justice issues. What do we, how do we look at um, this industrial complex that's set up to house our community, uh, the prison system? All of those things impact on our lives. And yes, reparations will be, uh, uh, is important, but we have to be really educate our community about what is happening to them, what reparations would mean, and think about what we need. Uh, it is an ongoing struggle. Um, yes, I see myself as a professional, in a healing professional, but I also see myself more as part of the community of African people in this land that we live in. So it's really, really important that we look at all aspects of that. Um, I think that we have to look at ourselves, we have to educate ourselves. I think social work professionals need to be educated about the issues. And those who are not of African descent need to educate themselves about our history in order to work with us effectively. So I, that's 
basically what I say, we have to work diligently to, to because racism is here, it's not going away. It's been here, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I've been dealing with it since I was in elementary school. And so it is something that we have to realize, acknowledge, but we have to keep on keeping on, as they say. So I thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Come on, we can do better. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hey, that's a little better. Um, have you ever been in a situation uh, where somebody told you something about you, yourself, and you couldn't see that thing as being true in any fashion, shape, or form? Has that ever happened to anybody here? Yes. Well, I submit to you that that most commonly happens to African Americans when people get, talk to us about freedom. That we've been free for a long time. Mm -hmm. That, you know, we've enjoyed the fruits of freedom for hundreds of years. So what's the beef? What are we complaining about? I also submit to you that there would be no need for a movement that says black lives matter, that black lives truly matter and are protected. So that's going to deal with this elusive thing called freedom here in the United States. Uh, America, uh, you have a group of people all different shades, um, very diverse group of people who have experienced um, everything but freedom. So in proclaiming this decade, uh, the international community is recognizing, in my opinion, that people of African descent represent a distinct group that do need respecting and protecting. I'm going to get to some of my personal recommendations. But first, I want to um, say to you that where you start does not mean where you're going to end up. You know? And because we started in slavery in this country, that's not the you know, end all, be all of the story. Uh, and to illustrate that point, I'm going to share a little bit of my own personal story. Uh, Maya Angelou uh, wrote a book called I Know Why I'm Cage Person. And I identify with that a great deal because I started life at 27 years old as a criminal drug addict um, in Bethel Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. And I say I started life there because the 27 years that preceded uh, uh, me coming to grips with my addiction and dealing with my addiction were years when I was enslaved physically and mentally, physically to a drug, mentally to a society that told me that I had never been to anything, I would have never amount to anything, and consequently I bought I bought the story, and so I lived life every day trying to destroy myself. Um, at 27 years old, I went into a treatment facility to get my life together. I went into a treatment facility, and I started making progress. But because I didn't understand uh, who I was supposed to be and many of the values that that should have been taught to me, that I should have learned about. The man I should have been was elusive to me, just like this thing called freedom. Um, so what happened is, after being in this program for, I guess, close to two years, I had made some significant strides. I was in the latter stages of the program. I was in 
Golden College. I was working, you know, had a girlfriend. I thought I was doing pretty good. And um, one day I was walking to the store with the director of the program, and as he was walking in the street, I wrapped a piece of candy and I threw the paper on the ground. And the director stopped me and said, you know, I thought you were going to make it, but I see that you're not. And I said, what? I said, what are you talking about? Said, I'm not going to make it. If anybody's going to make it, I'm going to make it. I'm in college, man. I got a job. I got a woman, man. I'm, things are moving along pretty good for me. Um, the director said to me, you haven't developed any social consciousness. The mere fact that you could draw that piece of paper on the ground and not think about who has to pick that paper up or who has to come behind you and clean up behind you or who has to essentially take care of you because of your negligence and being able to take care of yourself. It was a powerful moment for me. We stood in the street on 10th Street between Avenue A and B for about 10 or 15 minutes while he rammed this message into my psyche. Um, needless to say, I don't live it today. <laughs> um, but more importantly, I learned the lesson that, you know, if we want something to happen for us, we have to be partakers in it. We have to do something, you know. The professionals could do but so much, the educators could do but so much, everybody can do but so much, but we have to be committed to take part in our own destiny, our own future, and reshape our future. What it was in the past, there's no indicator of what it has to be in the future. So that brings me to this decade. And it was said earlier that, you know, the United Nations making a proclamation may not mean very much in and of itself, you know, uh, in terms of changing things. But it's, it's a powerful message that's been put out there. Now we have to embrace the message and do something. So I'm going to offer four recommendations that I think would be helpful, okay? First of all, I think everything about our impoverished state in this country has to deal with lack of access. You know, uh, and access in these four areas. Access to quality health care, access to economic opportunities, access to housing, decent and affordable housing, and physical protection against abuse, uh, discrimination, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think we have to be active in these areas. We have to speak up for ourselves, uh, advocate, mobilize ourselves, go to Albany, go to Washington, go to the places, you know. Uh, you may not like the situation, the administration, or anything like that, but if you're going to sit highly by and not resist, and not speak up for yourself, not do anything, then it doesn't mean anything. So this declaration by the United Nations will not mean anything unless we do something. That's my message. So um, I would just like to encourage everybody here to get active, you know. And what, whatever group you think is going to give you the best bang for your buck, you know. Uh, NASW is doing quite a lot of things. Uh, there's substance abuse associations, there's mental health associations, there's community organizations, there's faith-based organizations. Get involved. Do something. Don't sit idly by and watch things happening around you and not take part. Thank you. Before I open the floor for questions and answers, I want to say how we got here tonight. We got here tonight because of the generosity of a modern day abolitionist. His name is Andrew Diskoski. He's coming, he's, he's teaching tonight, but he came in. Andrew, please stand up. Uh, 
Andrew is a good friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, and he is the founder of harm reduction psychotherapy. We are saying that if anyone is suffering from any kind of disorder, they're not an addict. They are a human being with a, a disorder. And our field has characterized our people in terms of these very uh, vicious uh, malicious labels, dope fiend, addict, crackhead. This dehumanization process is, is like, how can you bring those that language, somebody mentioned language, how can you bring that language into the very profession that's supposed to help this individual? But this is the language that we use, and this is the language that we, we spread. We talk about resistance. So Dr. Tosky has created this, this harm reduction therapy that he teaches here as a professor in the school that you can get a certificate in, uh, in that uh, particular psychotherapy. I invite you to explore that. And before the night's over, I'm going to ask him to say a few words as well. Uh, but what I want to do is first open the floor to those individuals who were waiting to speak before. That, the floors will be open to them first. Uh, please go to the mic. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. We can hear you. We can hear you. That's all right. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, my question is, I've heard and read a, a, a bit about what the United Nations is doing now, and have been studying some of the other decades, if you will, the decade for women, the decade for indigenous people, and et cetera, et cetera. So I was really curious to see what would happen with the decade for people of African descent. I'm with the African Diaspora Consortium, and um, a fellow organization, but we um, are trying to work on some things, and I'm just trying to figure out if the, if the UN hasn't really done anything, and doesn't really have the power to do much besides advocate and bring things to, awareness um, and the U.S. isn't really willing to do anything per se. What has been done? I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to dig deep and research and find out what <coughs> is going on right now so I don't want to um, start something new that is, that's already going on. I'd like to join whatever there is already happening and bring something new to the table but I'm curious to find out what sources can I um, look at, look up, um, <coughs> contact to find out what is going on around the world. Well, remember, this is the second panel of yeah. human service providers, uh -huh. so they don't work um, full time. But they're still no, no, not just, um, I'm sorry. So not speaking to the UN directly, um, and I will maybe ask you that question later specifically, but just in terms of, um, thank you, the last gentleman um, just mentioned the four things that he looked at when he asked it to uh, quality health care, economic opportunity, housing, physical protection as well. Um, but do you know of any other things that are going on right now, um, even in these areas that are active? What sources, is there something already out there, is there a website or something that you can go ahead and contact now to get involved and see what's already been done? Well, as I mentioned, there are thousands of organizations. Uh, all you have to do is turn on your computer. <laughs> um, and, uh, seriously, though, it, it, once we get the will to do something, you know, uh, you know, there's the same way there's a will, there's a way. And, then, and it, it's a pretty profound statement because the opportunities are dead. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the ones who are with this in terms of the conversation. So, what we did was take those three things and began to unpack those three things in relationship to what we think could be happen over these next period, this next period of time. And that first theme around recognition, we just identified, you know, there are hundreds of things that can happen around recognition, but what we did was look at three things. Uh, each of us came up with something that we thought would be relevant to recognition. And one was getting more media coverage and getting people involved in the conversation through some of the social media. So that would be one way that we can start to think about getting this information out, the message out, as Mr. Kirst talked about on the stage. 
So I think the message is the most important thing right now, and the people will act from the message if the message is strong enough. The second thing we thought about was conversations or dialogues in the communities where this conversation is not being had. Creating opportunities and designing conversations in communities that can be in this conversation, because many times we talk about people without the people that we're talking about in the conversation. So it's really if we could design conversations around communities around the nation, or right here in New York City initially, to begin to think about how can they be in that conversation with people in these circles, or with people not in these circles, you know, um, conversation itself. And then the third thing um, is Mary talked about communication between groups, um, you know, in terms of the, she was talking about at one point she's retired as a social worker, but when cultural relevance started to come in, that when there was a diversity, that people began to talk to each other they had to because they were in the workspace. And I want to recommend everybody to go and see Hidden Figures because that can help you begin to understand what the dynamic is around being able to talk with each other or to be in a place where people have gifts and contributions to make that we don't recognize. And I think our communities have that. It's not all in the intellectual space, that solutions to make it this um, decade, a decade that can be memorable. And then um, we only got to justice. And justice, uh, we talked about this, and I think that uh, our concern is justice it is very subjective. And many times, uh, this idea of justice, we need to have conversations around unpacking justice, unpacking what justice means. Because if you think about patriarchy, in terms of what justice means to a patriarch, or in from a masculine perspective, then we might be looking at something different when we talk about the moral content or I for an eye, what does that mean? So we need to unpack that term justice. And also we talk about, um, I think as Mary mentioned, equal justice under the law. But then we have to talk about who creates the law and you know, how those laws are uh, represented for humanity. And so those are some of the things that we think that we can start thinking about as it relates to some actions around uh, some of these things. Let's get right here. This group, what did you talk about? Well, one of the things that we talked about was taking this back to the community when we got funded with our speakers. And I work with people who live with HIV. And so one of the legal dialogues that we had to have next week, we this disease that they as traumatizing as it is, uh, one of the things that we have to deal with in our community is complex trauma. That's okay. People are traumatized. When a person is traumatized, they can't even give thought to some of these actions and uh, actions that need to take place from a social perspective. Not at all. And so we have to deal with that trauma in order to get them involved. That's one of the things.
one thing that's important is to identify and recognize a broader or fuller spectrum of oppression. For example, you know, some among the, the oppressed might feel, well, I don't want to privilege, so I don't want to go. But actually, you know, that's part of the spectrum. And you know, to fully you know, characterize the spectrum of oppression is important for recognition. And uh, in terms of justice, that it's important to advocate on behalf of the press. Of course, that's obvious, but um, how do we do it? Well, one way we can do it is to uh, question authorities with hypothetical scenarios. Like, for instance, go to the police station and ask them, well, you know, in this scenario, how would you respond? Right? And, and get them to really think about it. And then in terms of development, to um, understand the culture is important. Otherwise, we can't respond appropriately. So, you know, as my own example I, I gave uh, to the cameraman, that, uh, you know, uh, I grew up in uh, Hong Kong, and, and I, it didn't occur to me that being a British subject was actually a, a form of independence. You know, and until I came to America, it became naturalized, and then I thought, oh, wow, I have a little more privilege now, but actually, you know, not quite. <laughs> so, um, you know, I landed in America at the tail of the Vietnam War, when uh, Asians were not appreciated. So, you know, um, the, the, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, cultural competence is what really uh, helps development in our case. Thank you for being here. Any uh, comments or uh, reports back here? No. <laughs> Give them a hand anyway. <laughs> so um, I'd like Andrew to come up there. And, and Jennifer to come up. They made this event possible. <laughs> Give them a hand. Yes. Um, well, I wanted to say that um, Naje really was, uh, I think, the first and most important uh, teacher for me about um, structural racism. And um, although you know, I'd always been aware because I actually was involved with the civil rights movement when I was. 13 years old, uh, and the good fortune to tie in with a very special crowd of people. So that has always been a very important part of my identity and my, uh, I don't know, my place in the world. But, um, you know, a bunch of years ago, Anaje and I met, and um, he really introduced me to a more systematic framework for understanding structural racism and the way in which institutions and um, all of us participate in perpetuating it. And, um, you know, and what I've been learning over the last number of years is how important it is for white uh, people to own um, responsibility for educating ourselves and educating our community. Uh, and I guess that you know, also kind of links for me into another idea that I've been working with that really came to mind today, which is about leadership. Uh, and that you know, each of us in our own communities and families and institutions, um, want, as we begin to become enlightened and educated about these issues, we begin to see it in action every day in our lives. And I think then, we have to we have to own responsibility for stepping up and speaking up about what we see, uh, and that's I think how change is going to happen. Um, so you know I'm I mean I've been really honored to know Anaje and also to um, have the uh, connections here at the New School and at our Center for Optimal Living, where Jen and I work together to be able to use our resources to support this effort specifically, but really the, this broader effort that we're all involved with in more of an ongoing way. You know, there's another idea that I've had that's been stewing. You know, another one of my mentors and teachers is a woman many of you may know, uh, Deborah Smalls. Uh, and um, one of the things she says loud and clear is that each of us needs to create con you know, conversations in the various spaces that we live in, that we work in. 
uh, about these issues. And so I've been gestating this idea about starting some kind of a ongoing uh, discussion, conversation, community at our center uh, about racism. Um, to create a space for people to come together, to learn together, to explore, and to strategize. Um, so today, you know, this uh, meeting sort of has me feeling uh, even more energized about kind of putting some energy into making that happen. Really thank you for the opportunity to uh, contribute to this effort.